destroy from the top of his head to the soles of his feet and that you would eradicate every cancerous cell from his body, Lord, that you would restore what the disease and the cancer has tried to steal and that you would bring about a miraculous healing over his life. And we lift Sister Judy that you would cover her, Lord, with your peace and your strength, Lord, that as she meets the needs of her son, Father, that you would undergird her with your strength and you would lift her up, Lord, and that there would be a joy in the midst of this, that there would be a peace in the midst of this that passes all understanding and father we lift before you brother and sister Sadler Lord that you would minister to their needs and that you would touch brother Sadler's back and you would bring about a complete healing Lord that his mobility and his strength Lord would be better than what it was before that your miraculous healing touch Lord would perform the work and father if there are any other needs in our church and in our community we commit them to your care father for we trust in you And we lay our needs before your throne and we have a confident hope this morning, Father, that you hear us and that you are near to our needs and that you are moving and working in our midst. And we pray all of this in the powerful and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. The church said amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. We are so excited that you are here today to celebrate Jesus with us, because that is why we come to church on Sunday mornings, is to celebrate the fact that Jesus is risen and that we serve a powerful and living God. If you're a first time guest here this morning, my name is Pastor Stetson, and here at Church Alive, we believe that we exist to know God, to make disciples, and to serve the world. And you get to be a part of that this morning through our time of worship and giving and looking at the word. And we're going to continue our a time of worship with giving this morning, we have the opportunity to worship through our finances. And today we are going to be giving towards our general expense fund, which is what gives us the ability to pay our bills and uh, meet the needs, uh, the physical needs of this building and this property so that we can continue to be active in ministry. And I wanted to share with you a passage of scripture that comes from Proverbs 11, verses 24 through 25. And it says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And this is a pretty straightforward passage of scripture when it comes to our finances. It's basically laying it out for us that if we are generous with our finances, the Lord will bless us, but that if we close our hands and hold back, that destruction and financial doom will come. And some might view this passage as a threat, that you better be faithful with your giving or else. But what I view this as is a promise from God through scripture. This scripture is identifying that in our humanity and in our own wisdom, we are fallible and we will make mistakes with our finances. And that if we try to figure out all of the money things ourselves, apart from our relationship with God, that we will mess up and it will lead to financial destruction. But what the writer of this Proverbs also identifies for us is that when we are faithful with our finances and we allow the Lord to be the director of our money and we give generously, then we are entrusting to him everything that we have and we release control so that he becomes our accountant, that he becomes the manager of our funds and he protects us from ourselves and from certain destruction. So I don't view this passage of scripture as an or else passage. I view it as a beautiful promise that when we give generously, when we are faithful to the Lord in our finances, he is faithful to us as well. And so we have the opportunity to practice that generosity this morning, to practice faithfulness to the Lord and allow him to in turn be faithful to us. And we have four ways to give this morning. The ushers are going to be coming forward and you can give um, in the offering plate, or if you prefer to give online, you can do so. We have the church center app where you can give that way. You can text 84321. If you don't want to deal with any websites, if you text that with a dollar amount, you can give that way. Or if you're watching online this morning, you can even mail your checks to um, our clerk and treasurer, Sister Judy Hatton. Whatever Uh, you need to do to be able to give. We want to remove every barrier so that you can be faithful in your giving and faithful in your worship this morning. Will you bow your heads with me as we pray over the offering? 
Father God, I thank you for the ability that we have as a church to give generously this morning. I thank you that we are a people that have been blessed with abundance and so we can give in abundance. And Lord, I pray that over every heart and mind, you would help us to have a generosity and an obedience to your word this morning, not out of guilt, not out of um, some rules that we have to follow, but because we understand how good and how blessed you are have been to us, Father. So we pray over this offering, Lord, as we collect it, we ask that you would receive it into the storehouses and that you would multiply it for use in the kingdom of God so that souls might come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. take your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 14. And I don't know if you know, but today is Pentecost Sunday. This is the Sunday that we celebrate as the day where the disciples were gathered in the upper room and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so the title of my sermon this morning is Overflow of the Power. And we're going to be looking at how the Holy Spirit is still alive and moving in the church today. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 8 through 14, this is what scripture says. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. As they were walking along and talking, Suddenly, a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak which had fallen when he was taken up. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your scripture this morning. I thank you for your word that you have given us that has stood the test of time and is still speaking life into your church today. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive a fresh outpouring from your word and a fresh anointing from your Holy Spirit. Father, we recognize this morning that we need the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit and that without you, we cannot accomplish the tasks that lie before us. So we invite you this morning, Holy Spirit, to come and manifest yourself among us. Lord, we ask that you would speak from heaven this morning and that we would hear you and receive you into our lives and into our church. And we ask this in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. In this passage of scripture that we just read this morning, we are reading about the close of a relationship. We are reading about the end of a ministry relationship that has 
gone on between the prophet Elijah and his successor, Elisha. For years, they have spent time together, Elijah being the leader and Elisha being the assistant. And they have gone in ministry together. And they have seen the power of the Lord move mightily in their ministries. Elijah was the man who called Elisha into ministry. If you read through the books of First and Second Kings, you will find that one day Elisha was tilling the fields and Elijah went up by him and threw his cloak onto him. And Elisha was so obedient and following Elijah in ministry that not only did he give up the role and the job of a farmer, but he broke the plows apart, sacrificed the oxen that were pulling the plow and gave worship to the Lord and followed Elijah in ministry. Elisha had received an up close and personal account of the overflow of God's spirit that rested upon Elijah. For wherever Elijah went, Elisha also went. Wherever Elijah performed a miracle, Elisha was standing on the sidelines, taking mental notes and watching what God was doing through Elijah. You see, it was Elijah who prayed before the prophets of Baal and fire came down from heaven and consumed all of the sacrifice, even though it had been drenched with water in the midst of a drought. It was Elijah who had prayed for it to stop raining and for over three years, the heavens withheld the rain. It was Elijah who prayed for oil and flour to not run out in the midst of a drought and the flask never ran dry. And it was Elijah who prayed for the widow's son and he was raised from the dead. But it was the overflow of the spirit of God in Elijah that performed the work. It was not who Elijah was as a human being. It was not that he was other than human, it was that he had received an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on his life. So wherever Elijah went, the Holy Spirit also went and signs and wonders followed. Make no mistake this morning, while Elijah's life was filled with supernatural miracles, they were not performed by his own ability or strength. Elijah knew God personally. He had sought God personally. We've been in this series of seeking the Lord, and we conclude that series this morning on Pentecost Sunday to celebrate the reality that when we seek the Lord, we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was the life and the reality of the prophet Elijah. It was through Elijah's seeking and knowing God personally that God was able to use Elijah to perform the supernatural. And it was this life, it was this ministry, it was this anointing of the Holy Spirit that Elisha got to watch over and over and over and over. So when it came to the end of Elijah's life, Elisha was well convinced that whatever Elijah had, that is also what he wanted. Just stop here for a moment and point out that if we as a church or we as individuals will are going to see the miracles of God in our life and in the body of this church, we must be a church that is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no song we can sing. There is no scripted prayer that we can pray. There are no motions that we can go through that will be a substitute for the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we want to see the dead raised and addicts restored and lives changed and sickness be healed, then we must seek the outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit. And Elisha recognized this. So this is why when it came to the end of Elijah's life, he had one request. He did not say, give me five more years with you, Elijah. He did not say, give me all of the wisdom in the world. He did not say, give me riches and fame and prestige. He said, whatever this spirit of God that is resting on you, I want that. But I don't just want what you have, Elijah. I'm not satisfied with just what I've seen. I want a double portion of the spirit that rests upon you. And let me be very clear here this morning. What Elijah was asking for was not Elijah's spirit. 
It was not some hocus pocus voodoo black magic that he was asking that Elijah would reincarnate himself into Elisha. He recognized that Elijah had the spirit, not a spirit. He had the spirit of God living in him. So when Elisha says, I desire a double portion of your spirit, he was saying, I want the overflowing power of the Holy Spirit. I want the living God to come and manifest himself in my life so that everything that I've seen you do, God will continue to do through me, not for my glory, not for my benefit, but so that I might be faithful to the call of God on my life. Hallelujah. Elisha was not satisfied to live off of the stories of Elijah's ministry. Elisha was not going to be content with just witnessing somebody else perform miracles or to be anointed with the Spirit of God. Elisha was not going to be pacified with just a small portion of the Spirit of God. There was no settling. There was no negotiating. There was no relenting. Elisha said, I want the Spirit of God on my life, and I want it in a double portion so that I might experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And Elisha received that anointing. The scripture is very clear that when Elijah was captured up into heaven, Elisha witnessed it. He saw the chariots and the charioteers of fire come whisk Elijah away. And he picked up Elijah, Elijah's cloak and walked to the water. And he smote it with the water. He said, where is the God of Elijah? And the water split. In that moment, it was a realization of the anointing that was falling on Elisha. So this morning, I want us to understand that when we receive the anointing of the spirit, it is a new wine, not borrowed wine. Matthew 9 and 17 says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. This records a portion of a conversation that Jesus had with the Pharisees while he was walking on this earth and teaching and ministering. And these Pharisees, who were supposed to be the religious elite, they were supposed to be the watchmen on the wall watching for the Messiah. They were mad because Jesus' disciples were not following all of the religious rules that they had concocted themselves. And so they go to Jesus and they're complaining, shouldn't your disciples be acting the same way that we're acting? And Jesus gets very plain with them. He says, I cannot put new wine into something that is old. Really what he was saying to the Pharisees is I can't even give you the blessing and the anointing that my disciples are receiving because you are so bound up in what is old and what you have created that if I were to give you what is new, it would spill out on the ground and it would be wasted. I'm going to give the new anointing and the fresh power to those that are willing to receive whatever I want to do. It was in this conversation where Jesus told the Pharisees plainly, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. So we're left to ask ourselves, why is Jesus talking about wine in scripture? Well, in that day and age, wine would be put into leather satchels. And as it would continue to ferment, the leather had to be flexible. It had to be able to move with the changing pressure of the continuing to ferment wine. If you placed a wine that was still fermenting in a wineskin that was old and the leather had become dried and rigid and cracked, the pressure from the inside would burst the wineskin and both the wine and the wineskin would be completely ruined. What was Jesus really teaching here? He was trying to get the Pharisees and he is trying to get us to understand still today that he does not simply replicate what has always been done. He does a new work in new people in new seasons of time. Jesus gives new and fresh anointing to new believers. Jesus gives fresh power to young people. Jesus plants new dreams and new visions and new prophecies in a new generation. But Jesus also places a new and a fresh power in those who are a new creation. 
This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus is not excluding anyone from the fresh power. He's saying if you are found in me, you are a new creation. If you are completely sold out for the mission and the purpose of Jesus Christ, you are not an old wineskin. You are, in fact, still a new creation. And God is continuing to remake us in his image so that we might receive the new and the fresh power that he wants to give to his people today. Jesus understood then and he understands now that if you give what is new to something that is old, it gets ruined and spoiled. And what what am I trying to communicate this morning? I believe that on this Pentecost Sunday, God has a fresh anointing for each and every person that is in this room and a part of this church. I believe that while God has done some magnificent and supernatural things in our lives and in the past, that the past is the past. And God is saying to his church this morning, I have a fresh anointing. I have a fresh power. I am not done doing what I want to do. I am not just going to let you live off of the stories of the past. I am not done using the people who will allow themselves to be made into a new creation. I have a fresh power for you this morning. Hallelujah. I believe that on this Pentecost Sunday, the spirit of the living God, is breathing a fresh wind into our church. That almighty God is breathing fresh fire and new power over those that will truly seek his face and say, God, make me into something new. God, make me a new wineskin that is flexible and willing to receive whatever you want to pour into me. God, use my life as a vessel that can be filled up and poured out, that can be filled up and poured out with the spirit of the living God so that people in our community that have never known Jesus Christ as their Savior will come to know that there is a living God that loves them and cares for them and has sacrificed his life for him. Oh God, would you give us a new and a fresh anointing this morning? Hallelujah. It matters not what your age is or your life experience. Scripture says that if we are in Christ, we are a new creation, ready to receive new wine. There is not an expiration date on the anointing of God over your life. It doesn't matter what season of life that you are in. If you will release everything to the Holy Spirit and say, God, how do you want to use me where I am right now? What do you want to speak to me in this season? God, how do you want to use my giftings and talents to reach the world? God will give you an anointing that is fresh and that is is more powerful and if we will release everything to God I believe that he can do more in this season of life than he has ever done in seasons past if we will release everything to Jesus and receive that new power and this is what God did for Elisha you see when Elisha received a double portion of the spirit he was receiving a fresh anointing from God He was not receiving a hand-me-down version of the anointing that Elijah had. He was not receiving an anointing that had already been used up. And here are the scraps, Elisha. You can have what is left over. No, when God anointed Elisha, he said, I am giving you a fresh anointing. I am giving you a fresh power that is even greater than the anointing that your predecessor have received. It has been set aside, Elisha, specifically for you, specifically for this season, specifically for this time. And it is a new anointing and it is fresh power power. And yes, some of the miracles that Elisha would perform would be similar to what Elijah had experienced. However, Elisha went on to experience miracles in his ministry that Elijah never saw. He got to see God move in ways that Elijah did not see as he was walking this earth. And if you tally up all of the miracles that Elijah was able to perform in scripture, and you tally up everything that Elisha was able to experience by the power of God, Elisha performed twice as many miracles in his ministry 
as recorded in scripture because of the spirit of God that was resting upon him. So when Elisha received this anointing, it was not somebody else's anointing. It was not a borrowed wine. It was a fresh anointing just for him. And if we will press into the spirit of God, he will fill us to the point of overflow. He will fill us to the point that wherever we go, each and every one of us, no matter the season, no matter the situation, we will see the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working through our lives. Not because we have conjured it, not because we have checked off all the things on the to-do list, but because we have said, Holy Spirit, make me into a new creation and fill me with fresh power from on high. Church, we cannot afford to be a church that does not have fresh anointing. We cannot afford to be a people that do not have the Spirit of God actively moving among us. And it is going to require some uncomfortability. It is going to require some pressing in. But trust me, even in 28 years, I have seen the Father be faithful time after time after time after time. That when the people of God press into the Spirit, of God, miracles happen. When Jesus fills you with his spirit, he is not giving you a borrowed anointing. He is giving you an anointing that is specific just to you. I had to wrestle with this when I started in ministry. See, I'm a third generation preacher. Most of you know that. My grandfather pastored for over 45 years. He pastored this very church for six years. My father has been a licensed minister in the Church of God of Prophecy for over 40 years. And they are men who have seen the power of God move in their lives. Not because of any lineage, not because their last name is Harper, but because they were men who gave everything to the Holy Spirit. And because of this, people often identify me as my grandfather's grandson. Oh, you're Bishop Arnold's grandson. Or they identify me as my father's son. Oh, you're Bishop Tim Harper's son. He's such a great man of God. And, and I'm not knocking that this morning. I love it when people understand who my father and my grandfather are, not because of their personalities, but because of the miracles and the signs and wonders that God has performed through their ministries. However, when I started in ministry, I felt a pressure to live up to or to duplicate what had been done in my father's life or what had been done in my grandfather's life. You see, there is some pressure when you come from that type of heritage, when you come from that type of lineage where people have seen the spirit of God move through your grandfather and your father and your grandmother and, and your sisters and your brothers and your aunts and your uncles. There is a pressure to not want to let people down. And I've wrestled with this, but as I wrestled the Lord with this, he reminded me at Stetson, I didn't call you to be your father. I didn't call you to be your grandfather. I didn't call you to be any of your aunts or your uncles or your brothers or your sister. I called you to be exactly who you are. And the anointing that I have given you is specific to you, Stetson. So I have come this morning to tell each and every one of you that God has an anointing that is specific to you. It is not a duplication of my anointing. And God does not expect you to do the things that he wants to do in my life. And he doesn't expect me to do the things that he wants to do in your life. Because because there is an anointing that is specific to each and every person who would call on the name of Jesus. And we don't have to try and borrow somebody else's anointing. We don't have to try and just let it rub off on us. We can get face to face with the spirit of God. Oh, hallelujah. And we can receive an anointing that is just for us. Hallelujah. We are not seeking a borrowed anointing this morning, church. We are seeking a fresh power from on high, authored by the Holy Spirit himself. Secondly, this morning, when God gives you the overflow of his anointing, walk in boldness. You see, when Elisha walked away from Elijah being carried away, he walked right up to the water and he picked up his cloak that had fallen off of Elijah. And he walks up to the water 
There's no hesitation recorded in scripture. And he takes the cloak of Elijah and he smites it. And he says, where is the God of Elijah? And immediately scripture records that that river of Jordan was split in two. And Elisha walked through on dry ground. You see, when Elisha walked up to that water, he didn't say, oh, water, please part for me. He didn't say, will you please do what you did for Elijah? He didn't get there and pray for 10 minutes. He simply took the anointing that God had given him and he smoked the water. And he called on the name of God Almighty and commanded that water to be moved. And it had to respond, not because of who Elisha was, but because he had received an outpouring of the Spirit on his life. When God gives you his Spirit, walk in authority. Walk in boldness. We cannot afford in this day and age to be timid in our anointing. We cannot afford in the society that we live in to be scared of if God will do it or what God wants to do. When God authors it, all we have to do is walk in obedience and walk in authority. And this is when why Jesus said this in scripture when he gave authority to his disciples. He said, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. You see, the disciples themselves did not walk in their own authority. They walked in the anointing of God Almighty. So church, in 2023, when God commands us to do something, we are no different than the disciples. We are no different than Elijah or Elisha. The book of James says Elijah was just a man. He's no different than you and I are. When we get face to face with Jesus, when we get the overflowing of the Spirit of God, we are anointed to to go in authority, and we do not have to be timid with the mission or the purpose that God has given us. We simply speak to it, and it has to bow at the name of Jesus. When God gives it to you, walk in it. Oh, I wonder what it would look like for our church and for our community if collectively we decided that wherever we went, we were walking in authority, that we weren't going to beg, that we weren't going to just be worried about it, but that when God spoke it, we would speak it in authority. Scripture says that whatsoever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We have the authority to walk into this community and say, Satan, you have no authority over this house. You have no authority over Blue Lick Elementary. You have no authority over Blake Elementary. Satan, I bind you with the power of the name of Jesus, but I loose all the authority of heaven over this community that lives would be turned to Jesus that hearts would be drawn to him that the fathers would be turned to the sons and the mothers would be turned to the daughter oh I speak in the name of Jesus that addiction would have to break at the name of Jesus that pornography would break at the name of Jesus that homosexuality would break at the name of Jesus because we are a church who has received power from on high and we do not walk in timidity but we walk in authority this morning Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Do not let anyone discourage you from what God has done in your life. We are recipients of a new wine, of a fresh power. And if somebody doesn't understand it or they discourage it, that's because their wineskin is too old. They're too dried up. Their leather is too cracked to receive what God wants to do. Don't you let anybody tell you that God can't do it or that God won't do it. When the author gives it, there is no power in heaven or hell on the earth or under the earth that can revoke or resist the word of the Lord that goes forth. When God gives it, oh, hallelujah, there is authority in the word. The Pharisees tried to do it to Jesus. They questioned every miracle that he did. They tried to disqualify the place, the time, and the power from which he did his miracles. They even called Jesus Beelzebub. They said he must be possessed by Satan himself. But Jesus said, no, I am the truth and the life. I am the resurrection. And at my name, every man and woman shall be saved. I believe that God is calling us to walk in a boldness under the anointing of the Spirit 
to spiritually take back this community under the name and the banner of Jesus Christ. We do not have to sit at home and watch the news and wring our hands and worry and say, oh, I just can't believe what's going on in the world. At those moments, we should go into the prayer room and shut the door behind us and to begin to call out in spiritual places and to put on the armor of God and wage war against the enemy. Paul said in Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood enemies, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And it is time for the church to take on the armor of God and wage war in spiritual places and say, not in my family, not in my workplace, not in my community. Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus, and he will have to flee. Hallelujah. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 38, anyone who is thirsty may come to me, and anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. Notice what Jesus said to the crowds here. He said, anyone who is thirsty. Again, there was not a qualification. There was not a prerequisite that people had to meet in order to receive this invitation. There was no age restriction. There was no education requirement. He simply said, anyone who is thirsty may come to me and drink, and I will give them a living water. I will give them a power from on high, and it will flow out of them like a mighty rushing river. Jesus did not limit the work of God to a particular type of person. Rather, the only qualification is that we be thirsty, that we be seeking, that we be pressing into the spirit of God, that we be a fresh wineskin, a new creation, so that we might receive what God wants to do. And I want to encourage you this morning that if you have received Christ as your Savior, then you have allowed him to begin this work in your life. And Jesus went on to say that rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And the verse that immediately follows identifies that this term living water was referring to the spirit of God or what we would commonly refer to today as the Holy Spirit. And I love how the King James Version translates this part of scripture. It says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Now, Jesus loved to teach in metaphors and parables, and he wasn't saying that when you receive Christ, that physical water is going to burst forth out of your belly. But the belly and the heart in ancient Israel was considered to be the center of who people were. It was considered to be the very essence of their personality and their character. So when Jesus identifies that those who drink from the well of the living water will burst forth living water from their bellies, he was saying out of the very core of who you are, you are out of your spirit my spirit will flow that wherever you go life will follow because of the holy spirit flowing through you I don't know about you, but that's exciting for me this morning, that wherever I go, as long as I'm in tune with Jesus, that life will flow out of me, that miracles will flow out of me, that restoration will flow out of me, not because of who I am, but because the word says that living waters will flow out of the bellies of those that drink from Jesus. Oh, we need to drink from Jesus this morning, church. We need to have a pursuit of him that allows him to place his river of living water in us so that it will flow out of us wherever we go. Thirdly, this morning, we must pursue the overflow of the spirit. Acts chapter one, verse eight says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Not you might receive power, or some of you will receive power, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And certainly this passage of scripture is familiar to those that have been serving the Lord. But when Jesus was preparing to go back to heaven to ascend after his death and burial and resurrection, 
he gave his disciples very specific instructions. He told them to go to Jerusalem and pray for the power of the Holy Spirit and not to leave until they received it. And there was no equivocating in Jesus' command. There was no waffling back and forth. He says, go, wait, and seek, and you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We must pursue what we want to receive. You see, the disciples were not casual in their pursuit of the Holy Spirit. They did not go back into Jerusalem and each go to their own homes and get back in the rhythms of life. They didn't go and try to figure out what they were going to eat for dinner that night or what they had to do at work tomorrow. Jesus, the Messiah, the living Savior, has told us to go and seek and wait until we receive power. So everything else became unimportant. Everything else was set to the side. And the disciples and 120 people gathered in the upper room and they set themselves before. For the Lord to seek the power of the Spirit. They were not casual in it. It was not when they had time left over at the end of the day. It was their only priority. And Scripture tells us that they stayed in the upper room for 10 days, praying and seeking. It does not describe lunch breaks, it does not describe naps or sleeping. It doesn't describe rotations. It just says for 10 days, 120 men and women sought the face of the Lord. And I know that when we read that, we think, wow, that's pretty radical. Yes, it is pretty radical. But if you also go and look at what happened after those 10 days, it was also radical. When the spirit of God poured himself out on the day of Pentecost, he did things that had never been done before because there was a group of people that had sought God like he had never been sought before. And if we are to be a people that will actually experience the power of the spirit as we read about in scripture, then we must also. So get radical in our pursuit of God. What I find intriguing in this passage is that the disciples had not been given a time frame. Jesus did not say, go and seek for 10 days, and on the 10th day you will receive my power. He simply said, go and seek me in Jerusalem and do not leave until you receive power. You see, 60 seconds before the power of the Spirit blew through the room like a mighty rushing wind, the disciples did not know that they were 60 seconds away from receiving the anointing. They did not know that they were about to receive the power and the breakthrough. And I fully believe that if they had stopped five seconds short of seeking the Lord, that the spirit would not have been poured out the way that it was because there was no hesitation in them. There was no option to get up and leave the room. It was, I'm going to be here until God does what he said he would do. And I'm just convinced this morning that if God had decided in his all-knowing nature that it was to be on the 20th day that they received the anointing of Pentecost, that those same 120 disciples would have still been in the room, still seeking the face of God Almighty until he poured out his spirit. You see, they did not have an idea of when they were going to receive it. They simply had the command, go seek and do not leave. And I don't know about you, but I know that in my own life, it's easy to put time constraints on God. Lord, I have 10 minutes to pray right now. So if you could do what you want to do in these 10 minutes, that would be great because I need to go and cook dinner in just a few minutes. God, I got an extra five minutes right now, so I'm going to give this time to you, Lord. And if you would pour out on me like you poured out on Pentecost, oh God, I want to receive the anointing. And then after five minutes, we get up and leave. I don't know if you've ever done that. I'm just going to be transparent and vulnerable this morning that I've been there and I've done that. But I believe through the narrative of scripture that what God is desiring from his people, that is when we go to the place of prayer and the place of seeking, we would pre-decide that we are not getting up until God says what he wants to say, that we will not move until he does what he wants to do because he is not working on our time frame. He is not constrained to our agenda. Rather, we are the wineskin to receive the new wine. We are not the author 
author of the anointing. We are just the recipients and the vessels to receive it. So whenever God wants to do it, however he wants to do it, our response is to say, God, I'm not moving till I receive from you. Hallelujah. We must have the mind of the disciples. I will not leave until I receive what God has promised. And understand this morning that that gets uncomfortable. Scripture does not tell us how large this room was. It might have been the size of this sanctuary. It could have been the size of that balcony for all we know. But 120 people for 10 days seeking the Lord. I imagine that it got a little hot in that room. Israel and Jerusalem is not really known for its coolness. I imagine that after 24 hours, there were some odors that probably started to permeate that room, that maybe the elbow room that they thought they once had was a little bit more constrained as people tried to spread out. I imagine that they were not kneeling on perfectly fluffed pillows so that their knees didn't get hurt. I imagine that in 10 days, there was some physical and emotional and mental uncomfortability that happened in that room. But there was also a resolution within their hearts that it doesn't matter how much I'm inconvenienced. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable this gets. It doesn't matter how unpleasant the surroundings might be. God told me to get to this place and not leave until I receive the power of his spirit. That's a type of resolution that we often do not have in 2023. And because we often don't have that resolution, we often do not see the spirit move as he moved on Pentecost. And we must say, help us, Holy Spirit. Then on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, verses one through six, it says that on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. This is the fulfillment of Jesus's promise from earlier in scripture that on that 10th day when they had pressed in and they had sought the Lord and they had been unrelenting the sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind came into the room and every single person on that day was filled with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It did not pick and choose who it rested on. It was everyone that had been in the place of seeking, everyone that had been in the place of pursuing the Holy Spirit received an anointing and it was specific to their life. And as they began to receive and speak out in the spirit and in tongues and in other languages, people outside who didn't know what had been going on for the last 10 days began to notice what God was doing. You see, sometimes the world is not going to know that we're seeking. The world is not going to understand what we're doing when we go into the church. But, oh, they take notice when the Spirit of God begins to flow and move in a way that it has never flown before. And people walking by the, the room where they were began to wonder, what is this loud commotion? It's quite early in the day to be drinking. But the disciples, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, and Peter said, oh, we are not drinking drunk with wine, but we have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it says that there were Jews from all over the world that day speaking different languages. And each of them heard the message that Peter preached, preached in their own language. 
You see, as he received the anointing of the power of the Spirit and spoke in a heavenly language between his voice and the ears of every person in that crowd, the Holy Spirit did a translation. The Holy Spirit performed a miracle that each and every person would hear the exact words that they would need to hear so that their lives would be turned to Jesus. And on that day, 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord because the disciples had sought God. God for 10 days. Oh, church, if I could tell you today that if we would decide right now not to leave for 10 days, that on the 10th day, God would bring 3,000 people to know his name and into this church, would we not do it? Would we not cancel all of the appointments and all of the family get togethers and all of the, I can't come to work. You don't understand. Lives are on the line. If I just seek the Holy Spirit, he's going to do something that man does not understand. And I don't have that guarantee this morning. And I'm not asking you to stay here for 10 days, but I'm trying to get us to understand the radical pursuit of the Holy Spirit that we must have if we are going to see his spirit move. It's not enough to just appreciate what God does in other places. It's not enough to have a knowledge of scripture or to hear the stories of days gone by. I'm not satisfied on the stories or the legacies of my father or my grandfather. I want to see God move with my own eyes. I want to hear him speak with my own ears. I want to see the Holy Spirit do something that has never been done before. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, give us a spirit to pursue you. As I close this morning, I want to turn our attention to 1 Samuel chapter 16, where we can read the account of when David was selected to be the next king of Israel. Scripture records that God told the prophet Samuel, fill your flask of oil and go to the house of Jesse. For today, I will anoint the next king of Israel. And in actuality, the process for selecting David as king was much more spiritual than just deciding who was going to sit on the throne of Israel. It was not as simple as Samuel walking over there and saying, David is the one. There was an anointing that had to take place for David to be able to step into the role as king of Israel. Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and Jesse brings out his boys. And Samuel looks at them, and the Holy Spirit says, that's not the one. Next. Nope, Samuel, that's not the one. Next. Samuel, that's not the one. Well, God, there's nobody left. And I know that you told me to come to Jesse's house. Samuel, ask him if he has any more sons. Jesse, is this everybody? These all your boys. Well... No, prophet, there there is David. Really, Jesse? I said I wanted to see all your boys. Well, he's out in the fields. He's tending to the sheep. Go get him. Well, prophet, that's going to take some time. That's fine. I'll wait. Go get him, Jesse. Prophet, you don't understand. He's the youngest and he's the smallest. Did I stutter? Jesse, go get your boy. So they bring David in from the field and Samuel begins to look on him with his eyes. But the Holy Spirit was speaking into Samuel in that moment and said, that's him. That's the one that has a heart after me. That's the one that you need to anoint. Samuel, uncork the flask of oil and go over to him and pour not just a little bit of the oil, but soak him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And scripture says that Samuel took the flask of olive oil that he had brought and anointed David with the oil and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. You see, there was actually a transference of anointing 
and a reception of anointing that happened through Samuel's obedience to anoint David with the oil. There was no mystical power in that oil. There was nothing special about it, but Samuel was being obedient to what God had told him to do. And David was being obedient to receive. And when he poured that oil, it would have soaked his hair and dripped down through his beard and saturated his clothes. And everywhere that he stepped, he would have felt the squish of the oil in his sandals so that David would be reminded that wherever he walked, he walked under the anointing and the power of the Spirit of God. Scripture says that in the anointing, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day on. In church, when God anoints us, he doesn't pour a physical oil over us, but he pours a spiritual oil over us from on heaven and he saturates every part of who we are that my mind and my thoughts and my tongue and my heart and my hands and my feet, oh God, would be saturated with the anointing of the Spirit. Well, that when I step to the right and when I step to the left, I would feel the anointing in my feet. Oh God, that when I put on my clothes in the morning, I would smell the aroma of the anointing of the Spirit on my life, that I would always be reminded that I walk not by my own strength. I walk not by my own might, but I walk by the Spirit of God that lives within me. And church this morning, God wants to anoint his people again. He wants to pour out his spirit again. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to be standing all over the church this morning. I understand this morning that many in this room have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I am in no way discrediting, discounting, or invalidating those moments where you have felt the Spirit of God pour out over your life. But I have to be obedient this morning with what God has told me to do. And he has told me to lay hands just as Samuel anointed David so that those that would pursue the Spirit would be able to receive a fresh anointing, a fresh outpouring of Holy Ghost power. And church, it is available to whoever wants to receive it. And it is not because of who I am. It is not because Setson Harper has some magical prayer, but I'm simply endeavoring to be obedient to the Spirit of God that resides within me. And I believe, oh, hallelujah, that God wants to fill this church anew, that he wants to pour out an anointing that is fresh for the season that we are walking into. Oh, that we will not have to live on what has happened in the past, but that we will testify about what God is doing right now, that we will see miracles right now, that we will see lives delivered right now. He is not done with his church, but he has a fresh anointing. And I'm not going to pour oil over your head like Samuel did, but I am going to be obedient this morning and anoint those who want to receive a fresh anointing of the Spirit. I'm not going to come drag anybody out of their seats. I'm not going to twist your arm but I'm going to be obedient to the Lord. And as Miranda sings this morning and leads us in a time of worship and seeking, if you want to receive a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost, I invite you to come forward in this altar that you might have the hands of the elders laid on you to receive fresh anointing and fresh power in the name of Jesus.